Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, thanks for coming to this session. And um, thanks to Frank, even though he's talking, for sponsoring <laughs> NDF. Um, it was greatly appreciated, Frank. We'll look forward to your party afterwards. Not least of all me, who's been sweating it all day about this presentation. Um, I'm going to kick straight into it. But a word of caution. There's probably too much content, which is a problem that we face in the world at large. Okay, clearly I'm not an editor because there's a really disgusting full stop at the end of museums and digital publishing, but never mind that either. I am a publisher. Um, and that's a bloody funny thing to be right now, isn't it? <laughs> because, um, oh, and I, I also run, obviously, to Papa's multimedia publishing team. And um, I think that's a name that very clearly locates us in the second decade of the 21st century. Um, I can't remember who it was who said of participatory culture, we are all media producers now, and that's true. But um, there are three of them by trade in my team, and a bunch of editors too. This also means that I run to Papa Press, which is New Zealand's unique museum publishing imprint, and that I have straddled many a raft of public good commercial, institutional audience focused, and open access copyright protective for some time now. And these are, of course, all relevant to us at NDF and in life in general. Um, so in this role, there's a few questions that non-museum people always ask me. And just for amusement's sake, I'm going to show you them too, particularly because we've never really appeared at NDF either. Do you only sell things through to Papa Store? No. Nope. <laughs> Do you only publish to Papa Authors? No. Nope. Um, Do your books have to make money? Yes and no. <laughs> and then there's this rogue one. This fourth question that I got asked one time. <laughs> and that scared the bejesus out of me. Not just because of who asked it, although I will reveal that it was a prominent minister with a direct responsibility for Te Papa. Um, <laughs> but because it goes to the dark and terrifying heart of what the bloody hell it is that publishers even do. And at a time when it's no secret to anybody, they are having to quite literally explain what it is that they do and to justify their value or demonstrate at least their value um, to the wider community. Now, and that includes things like Random House putting up, you know, sort of quite, quite um, instructive and corny videos about what happens at Random House with a kind of a do 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 soundtrack in the background. Um, anyway. Um, now, we probably all think that this whole nobody gets it thing is because of that. Um, and I very nearly didn't include that quote because people at NDF have been, been seeing it for years and years now. But it's just too bloody good. Um, publishing is not a job, it's a button. And we probably all think that that's the whole reason. Um, and I'll recite the, the litany of disruptions later. But um, it probably actually has rather a lot more to do with this. This is a conversation that Max Porter, um, Eleanor Catton's publisher, had with Kim Hill when he was here in New Zealand a little while ago. No, no, Kim, he said, we wear dark cloaks and we move in gloomy corridors. You know, I shouldn't even be talking to you right now. Um, the editor should be invisible. The publisher, be invis publisher should be invisible. Um, to the extent that in museum and institutional publishing, the fact that we are more often than not the content creators ourselves is often obscured. Um, now, Max was joking. Of course he was joking. But like all good jokes, it was about quite a true thing. So here's what we actually do. Just a few things. Um, you can browse through them at your leisure. But note that none of them is related exclusively to print culture. And note also, and it may not be eminently obvious to you, that it's a very rare and talented self-published author who happens to be able to do all of them. Um, many people can, but en masse it's quite a rare set of skills. Now just for the record, I'm not proposing for a second that every last one of these functions could not, in theory, be disrupted, or automated, or sourced elsewhere, or managed in some kind of other hitherto unexplained business model. Um, although I do share the opinion of the recent New Yorker writer, sorry, I haven't had time to Google the article, although I, I gobbled it up, that disruption um, is becoming a, a slightly absurd and over-extracted concept. <laughs> um, and I was joking with Mia Ridge over dinner the other night that um, you know you could disrupt the olive oil or somebody could disrupt you. Know, it really has become um, not quite what it was all about. Um, but because it's MDF, and because we're feeling a little bit bold this year, thank you very much, Andy, and because later on I might even challenge us all to be a bit bold enough to 
give up some of our favourite firm positions, myself included. I will even go so far to say that Clay Shirky was totally right. And um, the Publishers Association, of which I am a council member, um, isn't going to like it if anyone tweets that. It's just that he was only partially right, and it's really easy to be right when you only tell half of the story. Um, because the value that publishers and cultural, sorry, publishers add to cultural outputs and products, including but not limited to books, was never, ever, 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 ever limited to guarding the rusty old, clanky old keys to the machine down in the basement. Um, and it wasn't even limited to what Brewster called, on Tuesday, maintaining the economy of scarcity. Um, that's a later, later byproduct, I think, of our current environment. So in his excellent talk on Monday's night, Monday night's panel at the National Library, Tom Rennie talked about how weird it is to be called that IT guy after years of effectively working in books. And um, I want to say that it's equally weird to be called some of the following when your workflow has been um, except for the final spasm, digital for my entire career, um, when I am obsessively author and uh, sorry user focused, <laughs> and um, when some of the practitioners who've who've made these comments are people that I passionately agree with, um, dinosaur, just about everyone, but my husband included. Um, it's, it's bizarre to be called a dinosaur when you don't particularly feel like a dinosaur. Medieval soldier, gatekeeper, um, megafauna. That's um, somebody I admire very much and have had many a good conversation with Michael Edson. And in conversation with me in 2012 in his perfectly pleasant office in the Smithsonian, Michael said, publishers, they just throw things over the wall of the castle and they hope that they'll land on someone. And um, I, was forced to, I was forced to put him right about that because it's not entirely true at all. Um, and best of all, cocaine-snorting fat cat. Um, and that comes from someone I especially admire, Karen McGrain, content strategist. And many of you will have caught at Webstock back in whatever it was, 2012. Um, and here's a nice, charming image from the movie The Last Days of Disco, a personal favourite of mine, in which Chloe Savigny and Kate Beckinsale boogie at Studio 54 by night, no doubt, inhaling the contents of the cocaine trolley. Um, but by day by day, they <laughs> discover and publish amazing manuscripts and forge awesome careers as, you know it, publishers. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you what, it's enough to give you what Serena Chen called the other day, another life crisis. <laughs> Remember that? And her very stimulating talk about her comparatively short life. Um, so suffice to say that throwing things over the wall and hoping they hit people is not the kind of operation that we're running here. But um, I hope to show you a bit about that in a second. But yes, the change is huge, the change is huge. And then there's this. The, piquant local variant. And I started thinking about mowers and chickens and which ones die and which ones carry on. And it wasn't particularly flattering to be compared to either a mower or a chicken. And so I just abandoned that. But um, suffice to say that the tide is sucking out on New Zealand international owned publishing right now. And I have some very bold and tangentious and um, tendentious, sorry, and kind of exciting thoughts on what this all means for museums and cultural institutions and independence and funding models and the digital and everyone who's a content person and just plain making cool shit um, that I will share with you if time permits. And if it doesn't, ask me later about the farmer's market and paste up and punk. I'm not mounting a defense here of traditional publishing models and I'll be bored to sobs if that's what you think's going on. Um, I'm also not uh, charting the state of a beleaguered nation. And I'm certainly not going to enter into a discussion about the future of publishing, because Tom Rennie did a pretty good job of it on Monday night. Um, but I can only endorse his timely quotation of Leah Price at that time, and it's worth re recycling that today. Um, all I'm doing is calling out a corny old cliche when I see it. And um, publishers hate cliches. Uh, and um, we all know how it goes. And here I'm quoting Lincoln Michelle of BuzzFeed. We all know how it goes. We don't see the paradigm shifting sea change. We're not creating proactive new business models in the wake of this disruptive revolution. Anyone who reads print is a Luddite propping up a dying industry. If they don't get on board soon, they're doomed. Um, and sometimes it's hard not to think that this whole thing is just a plot by a bunch of really bored illustrators and Photoshop experts who are trying to cook up more and more ridiculous images of the death of publishing. And here's just a few of them. Um, are we not kind of at peak, peak ridiculousness, at least in this regard <laughs> alone, <laughs> purely in that regard? Can someone make a good picture of the death of publishing, please? Um, 
If we're talking cliches, this is a good one. It's by Mark Twain, who's a writer. Um, <laughs> the report of my death was an exaggeration. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are because technological development like success, we've all seen the picture, almost never travels in a straight line, but in a wiggly line. And in any case, it only looks like a straight line when we look backwards at it. Because for the indefinite future, we are very definitely straddling print and digital models. And because, as Lincoln Michel put it, dinosaurs don't always die. Enter again the chicken. Um, but anyway, what does any of all this have to do with NDF? with cultural institutions, with the digital and with museums. Um, I will give you a clue. It has to do with the functional sense of publisher that I used earlier, the idea that you perform a bunch of functions, um, rather than the vertically integrated industry sense of publishers controlling the technology. Um, and it has to do with the total cultural importance of literary culture, read culture, textual culture, and cultural value, and with what has always been motivated in museums, galleries, archives, and libraries by forces other than strict commerce. You can call it access or philanthropy or the public good, but you know what I'm driving at. So I will now turn to some specifics related to our publishing program because I realized the other day when somebody didn't give a show and tell that it was utterly depressing to me and I really wanted a show and tell. So I'm gonna try and cram this in real fast. Um, this is some of the stuff that uh, Tapapa's publishing program has been tasked with on a, um, a policy strategy or otherwise KPI-ish level over the past 10 years. Um, but they could apply to any institution. It's the last one I'm the most interested in today. Generate valuable and reusable content, data, and IP. And thank you for Victoria Leachman for helping me with my emphasis, because I could go deep on any of these ones. Um, so, what do we got? Um, In a given year, we sell about 50,000, and sometimes give away, about 50,000 individual units um, in print. I'll get to the digital in a second. Um, that's off the base of about 12 new products, of which there are additional print pro uh, sorry, digital products, which I'll get to in a second, reprints. Um, it does generate revenue, generates revenue, and this isn't a secret, of between 600,000 and $1 million a year. Um, those aren't net revenues, but they are the revenues that Tapapa receives before the costs are taken off. Um, and they go on to win lots of awards, which makes the museum look good. And they do this. They make people say good stuff about your institution. And sometimes they very explicitly correct the impression of your institution if it's causing you trouble. Um, what else was I going to say? And then really lovely things happen like this which I cannot resist including. Um, little pathetic story of Wellington art dealer beats Booker award winner. Literary catfight ensues. Um, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Museums can be the source of stories of vast national significance. Um, and the act of professionally publishing them can get them places that they wouldn't otherwise go. This is about icons na taonga. Um, I talked about valuable and reusable content and IP. This is an example from a classic print publication, icons na taonga. And um, usually when I meet people from museums, all they want to know is how can I make a collections book? Um, and I tell them, please don't. Um, please make a book that's about something other than your collections, <laughs> because by and large, they don't perform well. But icons is a very, very nice example of a well-performing collections book. So it was produced in 2002. And some of the places that it has ended up are as follows. There it is in the content from icons na taonga, including the photography and all the indexing information end up in collections online. Um, it resulted in derivative print products for very, very different audiences. So there it is in Treasures, which was from the tourist market. There it is appearing as five little books that we call little icons um, that were aimed at a more fam family-friendly audience. Um, we have a product in development, slow, slow, slow development, which is essentially a, um, I guess, a... Um, I'm going to say app, but we're agnostic about that right now, for exploring collection items using the content from those books as well. It ended up in the Google Art Project. The con content from Icons Natanga ended up in the Google Art Project. When to Papa joined that. And it ended up forming the scripts for a TV series with TVNZ called Tales from Te Papa. So the content from Icons formed the scripts for Tales of Te Papa that was then recorded, videoed, appeared on TVNZ back when there was a Channel 6. 
And then the content from that was packaged into a DVD and a print publication that was aimed at small children and their parents and that has um, gone on to do really, really well. So I feel as though sometimes the content that we create has at its front end a financial model that shows the entire costs being worn by the book, but that at the other end it's like grey water of London that's gone through everybody's body and, um, and, and has washed every, you know, the, you know the London water story. Anyway, there you go. Um, so since it's, that's a nice print example of the same thing. And I don't even know where the hell it's gone. Like what I want to do is a kind of a little track of a couple of pieces of content and really truly draw a map of the really many insane places that it's gone, but time didn't permit. So instead I'll tell you about some other stuff that we do. Um, we are delighted that when Te Papa restructured recently, we were able to be merged into a group that included our rights officer, our co digital collections team, um, our photography team, and to Papa's records people. Um, am I forgetting anyone, Phil? Not really. Um, knowledge and content. Because at last we were able to focus on maximal reuse of to Papa's knowledge, content, and assets um, in the publishing sense. And that was really exciting. And as part of that, we formed this multimedia publishing team. And its flagship product was Arts to Papa Online. Um, now, Arts to Papa was a response to the new approach to hanging art at to Papa, um, called Natoi Arts to Papa. And at the very, very beginning, we determined that we would not produce print catalogues for that exhibition. Um, instead, we determined that we would create an online property that was as iterative and modular and intended to grow and reflective of the multiple voices who are interested in art at to Papa as the exhibition itself. Um, we were forced to make it as a mini-site um, due to the functionality that we wanted and the limitations at the time of Tapapa's CMS, but it has been really successful. Um, one of the main things that I think your publishing people can bring you in a museum or that publishers can bring in a museum context or people with those skills can bring in a museum context is maintenance of content across time. So prior to that, Tapapa had been... Um, Parts of Tapapa had been prone to the um, exhibition mini site, which is made and then abandoned, made and then abandoned, made and then abandoned, and they just build up like so many, you know, um, what, tumbleweeds? I don't know, use your metaphor, but they're no more better, <laughs> you know, they're no, they're no more pure or good than a unwanted print catalogue gathering dust in the hallway, you know, down beside your shop. So um, we were very keen to get rid of the, um, that model. And so we did. So. What can I tell you about Arts to Papa Online? It is, I've lost my notes. Um, yeah. So it features online art exhibitions, digital media, events, and a free quarterly online magazine called Off the Wall. Um, this is the on the wall component, which reflects all the components of every single exhibition and every single refresh that goes up at to Papa. And it is, the way that it's developed is that all the content lives in Papa's collections management system, KEMU. So you can always relate the exhibition to the content that was in it. So we do drive it out of EMU as a CMS. Um, the, yep, installation views. Um, off the Wall. So Off the Wall is the online quarterly magazine and it combines our arts newsletter with um, the abilities that our team can bring to magazine publishing. So. Uh, online, multimedia magazine publishing. So interviews with artists and video, um, art multimedia, curator talks, um, print interviews, uh, studio visits by prominent writers, and all the rest of it. Um, since it launched, we have released six, seven, coming up this December for eight issues of Off the Wall, including those accompanying Natoi seasonal hangs. We have a growing subscriber database of around about 5,000 users. Um, the site has been well reviewed in popular media, which is a lovely thing to see. And it won a prominent web design award at the 2014 Museums Australia Publication Design Awards, which was very nice. Um, there, there have been about 15,000 individual visits and we noticed that they um, profoundly coincide with links from other sites or that they coincide with m really significant marketing from Tapapa, which we can't always you know, throw a resource at, obviously. But the Warhol exhibition did really well for us in that regard. Right now, there are about 23 clips of artist and curator interviews produced by our talented multimedia team. And um, these are growing. Then this other cool thing happened, and I certainly don't intend to take full credit for this, but this is to Papa's channel. So working really closely with uh, Ruth Hendry and Curden Krumanaka and our software development team, my colleague Jean-Marie <coughs> produced 
and developed at almost no cost at all. We're certainly talking, um, where are you, Jen Marie? Are you in here somewhere? No. Yes, less than $500. $150, the Tapapa Channel. Um, and the Tapapa Channel perfectly embodies the idea of the reuse of our media assets, which up till this point tended to be linked to um, the exhibitions that had birthed them. So this is the Tapapa Channel. Um, it released in late 1314 uh, with 84 videos, 52 audio clips, nine galleries, and before marketing had attracted 1,500 visits. Um, it has very, very strong engagement statistics. So while the numbers are low, we have, as I say, yet to advertise it um, or promote it really. Um, people are enjoying it and using it. And this is the kind of stuff you can see. And we're excited to say that we are now able to begin to digitise deliberately for it. We have a very modest budget for, for digitising for it. But that's one of the things that I think can come from closer relationships between um, strictly speaking web people and strictly speaking publishing or media people. What else can I say about this? Some of the cool stuff that you can see. <laughs> Slideshows. Um, this was another nice flip-flop. And this, um, oh yeah, I meant to say about Arts to Papa. So this crazy thing happened, right? So obviously it was all released completely free online. All the content is freely available and they're released under Creative Commons non-commercial licenses. Um, but no sooner were they out there then we realised, and they were also produced as floor brochures for in the exhibition, some of them, the ones that relate to on-the-floor content. Um, we found that bo uh, booksellers were selling them, they were retailing them. Um, so you might know, some of you might know Helen and Roger Parsons or their art, subscribe, their sort of database that they send out um, catalogues to. And we found all of our brochures on their catalogue and they were selling them for like four bucks a pop or two bucks a pop or something like that. And we had to, it was a brilliant, ironic moment. We had to bring them up and say, look, you can't be doing that. We don't want you to sell our stuff. These have been, um, you know, the artists have agreed to be included for non-commercial reasons and this whole thing is freely publicly available and would you just give us a link and a shout out. So it was a very nice inversion of our traditional relationship with Helen and Roger which would something like sell, sell, sell. Um, cool, what else can I say? This was a really cool flip-flop and obviously it builds once again on credit where credit is due on years of work by Tapapa's curators and co digital collections team um, on building information around the Berry archive. So you probably know who the Berries are. I'm not going to bang on about it. Soldier portraits found in Wellington. Um, but our team, working again closely with the software development team, developed an interactive interface so that members of the public could come and try and identify Berry Boys. And they did this in really, really good numbers, and there were some really significant identifications found, so many so that um, we were able to produce a book out of it. And the book occasioned more happiness and more communications from people in, in Vicargill. The real lever for this was, of course, the... Um, role of production shed and the TV show Sunday, um, which drove awareness of the Berry Boys and dramatised the search for their identities. And that was really great for us. Am I running out of time? Shit. Okay. Um, we do some other stuff. <laughs> Science lives, we do them with the rest of the team. Audio, audio. Uh, obviously, behind the scenes things. Okay, a few conclusions. Um, I'm going to try and catch the chase. Some of these come from my recent Winston Churchill Fellowship trip to America where I met some of these people. I believe that they would know what they were doing, but they don't know anything more than us. That's one of my conclusions. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the other one of my conclusions goes a little something like this. And I want to talk to all of us as colleagues rather than give you predictions and discussions about the state of the nation. Um, except that I'm going to say you should totally check out both the online catalogue online scholarly catalogue initiative and the museum publishing Blicky if you don't already. Um, so, what have I got to say? We need good content strategies and good content management systems, and we need to work very tightly together to achieve them. We need to collaborate, and I feel very strongly about this. Um, I would like to see a tighter relationship, as we're beginning to see in places like SFMOMA, MOMA itself, and the Art Institute of Chicago, between research, digital programming, and editorial slash publishing. Um, we are living in ideologically heightened times, my friends, and people freak out about their jobs. It's not just me, it's some of you as well. Um, and in these times, hypocrisy and contradiction are conditions of everything that we do, this conference included. Um, I have seen publishers share between themselves portable hard drives groaning with pirated material. I've seen zealous open access champions make an exception to lock down just their scientific research article, because somehow it's special. 
Um, I have seen passionate advocates of audience engagement and accessibility hit the print button on runs of 1,000 copies of heavily funded exhibition catalogues that just happen to have their own names on the spine, full of utterly inaccessible text with no discernible distribution strategy and a dark, unsustainable, dusty future ahead of at least 950 of them before the final indignity of the skip bin. My point's not that we're a bunch of frauds or liars or imposters, although some of us might feel sometimes like imposters. My point is that we ourselves, as a culture, as institutions, as professionals and as consumers, are flip-flopping, in-betweening, and straddling rafts, canoes, if you will, as they drift apart. Just like what happened to that poor girl at camp in episode one, season one of Girls. Remember when Shoshana told that guy about that horrible accident that happened to that girl who was standing on two canoes? All I can say is that they say you can die doing that. Um, certainly, it's not without risk. Or at the very least, it's mighty uncomfortable. So I have a couple of, honestly, only a couple of things to say. Um, babies in bathwater. Alex's talk yesterday was salutary to us, to us. Hell yeah, copyright has to change. Nobody doesn't think that. The entire Publishers Association thinks that. Um, but babies and bathwater, there is a livelihood at stake when it comes to literature, and authors are terrified. Um, they do want some degree of prote protection, and I think that's clear. Print is absolutely not dead. We've had our best year ever with products in which the value is bound up in the physical product. That ain't going anywhere. It's only getting more crazy. Um, punk planet. I've said this before publicly, so I'm just going to be brief about it. We're frightened. Selena Chen was right. The punks are right. <laughs> Get your hands dirty. DIY. Teach yourself the skills that you need to do the job that you want to do. Don't be afraid. <laughs> um, Get out there and make cool stuff and make it for other people. Kool-Aid, oh yeah. Um, drink the Kool-Aid, but maybe don't drink it all. Um, and, hang on, I've got another one, really briefly. It's gone somewhere. Yeah, don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> so, when I originally did this piece of work, I was in America, and it was 2012, and that whole Will Wheaton thing was quite fashionable as a meme, you may recall it. Um, we be dicks when we are frightened. Um, let us not be dicks. Let us remember the lesson of collaboration. That's probably enough pronouncing. Any questions? Yes, yes, sir. Um, you might have already said, but um, I'm not going to say. Have you published any two books as EPUBs, and are you going to, and will they be available through the library? That's such a good question. Um, I want to talk about how um, not digitising can be a legitimate business model. So we absolutely and emphatically want to digitise. We have to be really aware of what we prioritise, and Phil would agree with me about this. Um, there are things that we can digitise that have a far vaster audience than our highly illustrated print publications. There's every piece of evidence in the world that highly illustrated print publications work like dogs, and the technology is not there to make them pretty and enjoyable. I'm not talking about fancy apps like the Wasteland or the Gemstones. I'm talking about what happens to print books when you turn them into basically PDFs. Um, so neither the business model is there, nor is the um, technology there to support it in the form of EPUB 3, um, as yet, as an adopted standard. They are illustrated books? Yeah, like Blue Smoke. Blue Smoke yeah. Well. yeah. Well, look, it's, it's absolutely part of our plans. It's just that we're part of a big institution with a lot of digitisation priorities. I believe that Auckland's work was the result of a rather substantial grant. Yeah. All right. Um, hopefully that conversation can continue over break, which we're just about to head to. Um, before we do that, um, if we could all just uh, quickly thank Claire for uh, her work on um, sponsorship for this conference, because I'm sure that's contributed greatly to our experience. <laughs>